Business of Architecture, Episode 42. This is the Business of Architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is your host, Enoch Bartlett Sears, and this is the Business of Architecture show where we talk about two words that don't often go together, money and architecture. Yes, we talk about what a lot of architects don't like talking about, how to make enough money as an architect to pursue the kind of projects you want to work on. Here on the show, we believe that making good money facilitates making good architecture, and we want to inspire you to live a full life that isn't hampered by the stress of paying bills or finding the jobs. In this episode, James Butterworth, an architect from the UK, takes us on a journey through the economic crash, getting laid off from his corporate architecture job to fully booking his architecture practice and looking to hire more people. Now, James has figured out how to market and get more clients for his firm, and he appreciates that as architects, we need various marketing channels to work simultaneously if we want to have real clients. So without further ado, here's the show. Welcome back, Agile Architects, to the Business of Architecture. Today we're joined by James Butterworth. He's the principal and owner of Studio J Architects in Leeds, the United Kingdom. So, James, first of all, welcome to the show. Hi there, Ian, and thank you for having me. Well, it's it's a pleasure to have you, definitely. James, you've been, we were just talking, and you told me that you've been in business now as a sole proprietor for uh, a little bit over four years. Yeah, that that's correct. correct. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Tell me about, let's talk a little bit about your firm. First of all, give us an idea of kind of what your firm does, your focus, so people get an idea for who you are. Sure. Uh, well, I focus primarily on private clients, so whether that's a uh, individual houses or extensions that are predominantly in the residential uh, sector, but I also work with small businesses, so like you know, cafe owners and things like that, but not the kind of larger chains. So it's more the independence and that kind of the the, the personal uh, service through the, the one-to-one with with the clients that, that I work with, rather than a large group uh, of clients. Excellent. And with your previous firm that you were working with, what kind of work did you do there? That was completely the opposite. I was in a lar- very large uh, commercial practice. We worked with, I spent a lot of time working on education buildings for universities and colleges, also on leisure facilities and uh, city centre clients and large developers, basically the complete opposite end of the scale. Well, those are definitely very different markets. Uh, what, are the, what are the kind of the differences between working with those larger clients versus the kind of work you do now? It's it's very different. Uh, the the things you can take over that I learned through the commercial uh, marketplace, but it's mainly the the client that, that you're working with. If you're working with a developer, their end goal is for them to make money, you know, because that's that's their job. Whether you, uh, which is fine and fine for that, for them to do that. When you're working with a private client, whether it's their own house or it's a small business, it's a more personal thing that they're that they're looking for. So they're looking to improve their own lifestyle, whether it's by uh, getting a bigger house or a new house or kind of creating a work environment for themselves and a small, small group, group of people. But it's something that they they inhabit at, at, at the end of the process. It's not something that they're building and then selling on for, for somebody else to use. And so how does that affect the, the client's mentality in terms of the different viewpoints? They very much want to be more, more involved, but more involved not necessarily to, to save money. They obviously want, they have a budget and we have to keep to that and respect that. But it's getting the right end product for, for them and getting it working for them how, how they live. And so they, they need to have that kind of control and kind of understanding that also they want the ideas and kind of working with you and kind of rather than saying, give me 50 flats. In this in this block of flats, and we have to get so many square feet uh, to to make the money back. If it's you know if they only get kind of 50 square meters or 45 square meters, their uh, end results for their kind of profits doesn't really impact. It's whether it works for them as a as a family or or a business that's the key thing. Excellent. And how did you end up going from the commercial side 
to doing the residential focus practice? Well, uh, back in, in 2009, which is when I was working with the practice in the uh, beginning of 2009, uh, I, presuming it was quite similar in, in America, there was obviously a big uh, financial crash in, in the UK and uh, hit the construction industry very, 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 very badly. And in some practices, pretty much about half of the staff was made redundant. And uh, at my company, I, I, I was one, one of those people. Uh, the projects that I was working on was, was at the time was for some college buildings, some large college buildings. All the funding uh, was, was pulled for that, so none was being built. And so the company didn't have any projects, and obviously myself and, and several other people were, were made redundant. So in going forward from that, I was fully aware that, you know, of the current climate and thinking, well, I, there's, there isn't the ability for me to kind of go to another practice because all the practices in the area were doing exactly the same, the same thing. No, no one was hiring. They were all losing, you know, large portions of their staff. And obviously the buildings in the commercial sector, very few were being built. And so for me to set up and try and build those commercial buildings would have been very difficult. It was a very, very small kind of marketplace there. But what was happening was the residential market. And even though it was very difficult for a lot of people, and people were very worried about their jobs, their stabilities in, in all, all, all sectors of, of the country, whether they did finance or in education or, or whatever, it was a very tough time for, for a lot of people, but they were still being employed, and they were still having families, and they were still needing extra space. And so I saw that as an opportunity to kind of look at how we can, you know, getting into the residential market and looking at, at, at the extension. So, People who were, were in, in their current home, they couldn't afford to move because the, the cost of kind of moving in this country is quite quite large. And so they instead of kind of using that money to move to a bigger house, they were looking at how they could extend and remodel their current house to suit their on, ongoing needs. And so that was the kind of the the niche market which I uh, kind of focused on to uh, to begin with, because that's where there was where the work was, and it enabled me to keep practicing. As an architect, is there one of those industries that you prefer working in, the commercial versus the residential, that you actually enjoy more than the other? Sure. Yeah. Initially, uh, uh, obviously, when I, I worked in a commercial practice for, for nine years, and I, I, I enjoyed, enjoyed what what I did, and I worked on some actually fantastic projects. Uh, since I've gone to, to do the residential work and the, and the private and the smaller scale commercial stuff, I much prefer that that work. The, the clients that you work with are a lot more amenable and nicer. You have a nicer working environment. Uh, you, you don't, uh, I don't know if you have the phrase in America, but uh, you don't have the design by committee, which basically if you go into a, a company, you've got 10 people around the table and they've all got 10 different opinions and you've got to satisfy all of them. You know, you often have a husband and wife in residential who might have diff diff different viewpoints, but it's a lot easier to manage the, the desires and expectations for that and working with them and also seeing the end, end results and how happy they are and how much it has genuinely improved their life. Excellent. So currently you practice alone. Do you have a long-term plan for the firm and if so, what is it? Uh, sure, yeah. Over the over the last four and a half years I've been predominantly by myself. There's been periods where I've been a bit busier and I've employed a, another architect to, to work with me on short-term contracts as the as, as we go go forward in, in the next hopefully this year and in the next couple of years I, I plan to take on more staff but no more than one one, one or two people I don't, I don't want to grow to, to a large commercial practice I don't want to end up just managing jobs and not doing any design work I want to be, be an architect and design the building work with the clients and have that creativeness but there are aspects of lots slightly larger projects where I need a second or third pair of hands, which will enable me to, to, to work better for, for the client and get those slightly more interesting uh, projects. Okay, and what part of the business, now that you've been doing this for a while on your own and you've had to manage all aspects of the business, what part do you least enjoy doing? Um, I genuinely enjoy it all, <laughs> and and I do. I mean, um, when I was at the previous practice, I, I worked... Uh, on, on all different aspects of architecture, from the initial feasibility drawing through the planning and 
detailed construction drawings and overseeing on site. So I got a good kind of uh, foundation, excuse the pun, for uh, kind of of all the different uh, uh, aspects of, of of architecture. Since then, I'm still doing all that. I'm still working from the designs from start to beginning, but I've learned about how to do accounts, learned about marketing and uh, you know, all, all, all other things like that, which you need to be able to run a business. And I've enjoyed learning those things. And it's, and it's means that coming into the office every day is, it's a different day every day. I'm not kind of ch constantly churning out the same construction details or always looking at the same kind of planning drawings and things like that. It's, it's a, it's a really wide variety of tasks that I get to do. And, and I really enjoy that variety. And how many hours a week would you say, just just to estimate, do you spend running your business, the practice? Uh, well, running it or doing the the architecture. I guess everything. I just want to get an idea yeah. of people out there who are listening and thinking about going out on their own. How what's the time investment for an architect to run their own firm? I work a, a standard uh, week like I I did when I was in practice. I I start a little early and finish a little early because where my office is, I uh, I try to avoid the the busy traffic. So um because there's nobody telling me what time to start or, or go home. I choose to come in a bit early and finish a bit early. So I work a normal week. I, I Occasionally, I'll work uh, and go see clients on evenings or weekends if that suits them because of their busy working life. Like tomorrow, it's Saturday morning, I'm going to see, see a client uh, because they work away during the week and it's the only time that they're available. But most weeks, it's Monday to Friday, you know, seven or eight hours a day and, uh, you know, always give myself a lunch break and things like that. So I, I don't push myself 80 hours a week or, or anything like that. Good. Well, that's good to know that it doesn't need to rule your whole life, work, you know, 80, 90, 100 hours just to survive. No, no you, you, you don't. As I say, it's about kind of working smart, uh, not working extra hours. You know, if you, if you know what the end result is, what, what you have to get, whether it's on a design of a building or, doing your accounts, it's kind of getting to the end result at the quickest and most efficient manner while still getting it done, done correct. It sounds like you must manage your time well to be able to keep the hours to that set amount per week. Do you have any tips or strategies for your time management and how you're able to focus on what's important? Um, not really. I mean, my, my just by my own personal kind of nature, I'm, I naturally uh, I'm good at waking up in the morning. So, <laughs> uh, I, you know, I, I, I don't set my alarm clock and I haven't for, for several years. I naturally wake up and I'm happy to get up and, 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 and come, come into work. You know, a lot of people kind of fear Monday mornings and are looking forward to Friday afternoon. It's I, I, I don't mind it. I, I enjoy what, what, what I do and uh, if, if you enjoy it, you know, you, you, you just get, go and do it and you don't distract yourself by doing other things and putting things off, which is what, why things might take, take longer to do. I love it. I love it. James, you talked about at the beginning you had to do a lot of learning in terms of the financial bookkeeping, the accounting, everything that goes, probably taxes, everything that goes into running your own business. Was there something that stood out as being particularly a surprise to you or a little bit of a challenge in terms of figuring it out? Um, generally, I, I found it pretty uh, not easy, but I, I, I managed it perfectly fine until I became a, a limited company. And uh, I don't know how the company structures work in America, but going from a, a sole trader to a limited company, uh, when you're limited, you have to get an accountant to fill out certain forms. So at that point, I had to employ an accountant and take a, a you know a bit of a back backseat and allow him to do that, which was a little bit frustrating on my part uh, because I quite enjoyed it and and I still do as much as I can because uh, it means I don't have to pay the accountant as much. Uh, but it's fr from that step from being a sole trader. It to be in a limited company, it's, it means I had to uh, give control to somebody else. And what were the other options available to you in addition to a limited company over there in the UK that you could have gone, and why did you go with the LC? The, there's ooh, probably about maybe half a dozen different types of company structures, um, and I'm not an expert on, on these. Uh, I, I looked into them. To a certain extent, and, and spoke with other, other people. Uh, you know, that's always the best thing. And speak to your friends and family who have do, done things sim similar. 
and uh, going from a sole trader to a limited company basically because the the company uh, income w w was growing I wanted to separate my own personal finances from the company finances and that's the reason why I, I changed and it was the most sensible option through the advice that I, that I, I was given. <laughs> so, 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 you know, I, I was trusting other people. They gave me the various kind of kind of pros and cons of, of di different things. And in, in the long term, it was def definitely the best best route. Wow. Well, I guess I guess we have less to choose from. Fortunately, here in the states, I think there's about maybe at the most three different company structures that I would ever consider for an architecture so, firm. So there's lots of variations on the same thing. There's like there's a there's a, a partnership or a, a limited part partnership, limited liability, and they're all slightly different variations depending on where the liability is if you uh, get sued, basically, and uh, and uh, you know th th things like that. But uh, the the most standard is is a limited company. Sure, sure. I can imagine that the structures are probably pretty similar in terms of the the legal and the way they actually function. That makes a lot of sense. So James, take me, tell me a little. I'd like to hear a little bit of the story of those days when you found out that you were redundant. The economy was not doing well. You know, tell me what was going through your head. Was there any fear, doubt? You know, just I would love to hear. You know, what is it really like to be in that position? Sure. Yeah. Uh, no getting away from it. it. It's an awful position to be in because uh, you not only lost your your job, which is bad enough, but the realization that there are no other jobs for you to go to because previously if you left one job there was another company that that would employ you uh, but everybody was you know in the architecture and construction industry was all in the same boat and even people who kept the jobs had this big uh, percentage reductions on on their salaries and so the, the realization well you know I've trained a long time to be, be, be an architect I, I enjoy my job I don't want to do anything different. This is my career, and this is how I want to kind of spend my working life. So to get that re realization of well, there's there's nobody who's going to be able to employ you. If you want to carry on, you have to go and find the work yourself. And so it was, you know, it, I, I spent uh, a few weeks kind of ringing around various uh, practices and kind of uh, and seeing seeing what was out there, and just getting the same same response and things like that. And, Spoke with my family and friends, and uh, and then it was a case of I was with 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 a with a friend at a birthday party, just having a few drinks at, at the local pub, and I was sat uh, chatting to uh, a mutual friend friend of ours, and he said, "Oh, I'm thinking of build, build, building an extension. Do you want do you want to do that for me?" I said, "Well, yeah, I can do that. It's a bit of cash, so keep 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 me going while I fi find something else, and then." Uh, another family friend that my parents were speaking with, they said, oh, we're thinking of do, do, what, having some, some work done, done on our home, and this was a slightly bigger home and a, and a, and a you know, slight, slightly more interesting project. So, oh, that's two projects, and I'm not really tried here. These have just kind of fallen on, on my lap. So what if I actually made the effort to go and try and find this work? You know, there is obviously a market out there. And, and making that decision and having that re realization I, was, you know, I then spent the next kind of about month or so, kind of working out, you know, things like what I was going to call the company, which is a really hard thing to try try and work out. Making sure there's an appropriate website address which I could use, and set up company logos and standards and things like that. So I, I had everything ready. So for the for these jobs which uh, which I was working on and any future one, I was ready and waiting. And while I was doing this, I was just doing it on my computer in, in the corner of, the, of I was, at the time I was living in a small sat flat in, in the center of Leeds. It was, you know, great for social life, but really tiny flat. So when you're not working or going out, there's not much space to, 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 to spend your time in. And so I, uh, I, I, I set up about thinking, right, well, how do I get, get more work and, and start it from, from there? Excellent. So take me, tell me a little bit about the timeline. Uh, how how when did you kind of get the word or when did you see the writing on the wall that the downsizings were happening in, yeah, in terms so, of how long was that before you were actually let go well for me it, it was a re really big shock because uh, there was myself and uh, a couple of others working on this large uh, project and it was for a, for a sixth form college uh, and that's for kind of like 16 to 18 year olds and it was for basically completely re rebuilding the, the, the college uh, campus in, the, in, in this town. And uh, 
I was talking to, to a colleague and we were aware of the of the uh, economic kind of downturn and we were like well yeah it's really bad that we've got this project that's going to be going for the next two, two or three years so you know we seem to be all right and then we got a phone call literally the day before we were get, going to get go out to tender and get prices for it and they said the funding's gone we're not going to build it that's it sorry and so we were like a bit, a, a bit stunned and then there was a few little other projects in in the company that we were started working on but weren't really involved in anything so i kind of knew things weren't great and then pretty soon after that uh we were all brought into a into a series of meetings and said look company's going to have to let let a load of staff go and uh you know we'll we'll talk to you all all individually and that was probably all in the space of about 3 weeks from me thinking I'm okay here. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be able to ride out this, this, this bad, bad economy. To being at home, thinking, what am I going to do? Wow. So that happened in the course of three weeks, say. Uh, yeah, le less less than a month. Yeah. Wow. So, and then from the time that you you were sitting there in your in your in your flat, thinking, okay, here I am. What's next? To the point where you were starting, you got that first extension, then you started to get a couple of projects. How long was that process? That was probably uh, another kind of month or two. It was over the summertime, and I was spending that time uh, landscaping some of uh, my parents' gardens. So I was keeping myself busy and trying not to get too too upset and distracted. I always try and kind of get, get, get on with things. So I, my parents need, needed their, their garden uh, sorting out, so I kind of took to that. So it kind of kept me out got got me out of out of my flat and busy and obviously my uh, I was talking to my parents and kind of talking it through with them of what what we would what, what I should do my dad had uh, had run his, his business uh, for, for 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 most of his his working life so he was like well you know he gave, gave me a few pointers of you know what what not to do what to do what to watch out for and things like that and and yeah so it was probably about about 2 months of basically uh, uh Having no, no no income and not knowing what to do, and before getting back and, and doing doing the architecture. Were you actively searching for a job during that time, or were you just taking some time off? I I, I actively searched uh, certainly immediately. I, I was obviously searching you know, every day and uh, look, looking around, but there's only only so many practices in the area. There's only so many practices in, in the in the country, and when you've be, been to them all, and they're all saying this, the same thing. You, you soon realize what what how bad it was and you know and it, and it was very bad and I'm sure it was very similar in the states and in, a, in other countries as well yeah I absolutely think it was let's talk about you said your dad ran his own business and he gave you a couple pointers do you remember some of that early advice that he gave you um nothing in particular but it was more a case of kind of getting everything in place so you know so don't just to start and put a website up and then you get work and you you can't deliver that work you have to kind of organize yourself you know like i say get 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 all your all your standard like cab templates and things like that so when the work comes in you, you can respond to it and do it to a, to a high standard because those first few jobs are obviously really important you don't want to be giving uh the first few clients so you've got a bad service whether it's kind of taking longer or you know you, it's not not as well designed and developed, or kind of the and ju just kind of small things like that. So it's all about kind of getting getting everything set set in place before you kind of basically walk before you can run. Okay, I would love to talk a little bit more about that, about that, James. In terms of the things to get ready, you mentioned CAD templates. What other things should someone starting out put into place to make sure that they can deliver quality work once the work starts coming in? Sure. Well. Um, it, it's small things like having uh, a a good working environment. You know, I was working in the in the living room of my of my flat initially, and I knew that wasn't going to be you know, productive for very long because it's a small flat. Uh, luckily, I was I was single at the time, so you know I didn't have to kind of work around and 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 anybody else. But uh, it, it it wasn't ideal, so I I uh, I managed to find an office rent free. Uh, through through a, a friend of of, of my of my dad, and we, tell which, me about that. Did you ask around? How did you tell me about the rent-free office? That's an interesting resource. Yeah, 
Uh, I was obviously talking to my parents, and uh, I was seeing quite a lot of them at, at the time because I, I, I had had a lot lot of free free time, and uh, and I was kind of complaining and saying, oh, you know, you know, I want to make a go of it, but I just can't can't carry on as, as, as I am. I'm going stir crazy, spending all, all this time in this in this small small room and not being able to talk to anybody and things like that, and it's not a good uh, address. I can't bring any clients back there or, or things like that. So. He subsequently was talking to to a fr friend of his about you know what I was doing and this friend oh we've got a few, few, few spare desks because like everybody else they'd uh, made a, some some people redundant and says well they're sitting there not not doing anything you can come in use the, use the address for a bit business address because it was a, in a nice area in Lee so it gave me that kind of uh, professionality and uh, you know so people so you know and you know I mean I could. Bring, bring clients in because they had, had had a meeting room, and it gave me that that base, you know. And also just being able to talk talk to other people during the days, you know, m means quite a lot if you kind of if you're a sociable person, even if it's just a morning and how you're doing over uh, over get, get, getting a, a cup of tea in the, in the morning. It's having that interaction that helps and spurs you on to to, to get get going, and especially when you're in a working environment. You're more likely likely to work, whereas whereas at home I have the TV on, have the radio on. I still have the radio on now, but <laughs> when 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 I'm in the office, but I like working to music. Uh, but you know, I would be distracted by uh, watching the TV, or I'd think, oh, I'll go out for a run or some, something like that. I wasn't in a working environment; it was hard to focus and be be productive. As soon as I moved into that office, I was there all day, every day. Doing things, and so I was say getting all those standards, all those kind of uh, letterheads and things like that, all all organised. Okay, so we have letterheads, office office templates like documents, um, CAD templates. Any other things? Uh, what what else could we put out there for things to get in place? Uh, your accounts is is a key one. You don't have to pay for any. Uh, Expensive uh, programs or anything like that. I've always used just Excel spreadsheets, and just kind of knowing what's coming in, what's going out, and you can see at the however you do it. I do it at the every, at end of every month, and you can see how how things things are going, and you, and you can also predict because if if you just started a job and you know well I'm going to get paid X amount in two or three months time when that project finishes, you can kind of plan plan for that. So if you're doing a a marketing campaign and it's going to cost you a certain amount of money you may not have that available at the time but if you know in three months time that you're going to have a lump sum coming in, 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 into your account from a, from, a, from a project that you're working on you think well when that comes in I want to invest that money to gain more projects so you might kind of work on getting all the artwork done ready for if you put in for example an advert in a magazine or doing some flyers or, or, or anything like that you can get that all ready and ready to go so when the money comes in, it's there. You can go send it to the to, to the publishers or, or whatever, and you're good to go on on the on the next stage of kind of finding more work. So, did you design your own collaterals in terms of marketing pieces and advertising? Yeah, I've literally done everything myself, and until until I and well, I, I, I built I, I designed my first website myself, and to be honest, it was quite rubbish, <laughs> but it but it did the job first. For, for them, and uh, I, since then, kind of, uh, well, I, I did a second one again. It was a bit better, but not great. I then had a, a third one, which I paid a friend to do, and it was a bit of because he, he was an old friend of mine. I, uh, it was, you know, he, he did it for a, a good rate rate for me, so brought brought in a favour. You know, I get, gave him some favours on and other things, and it introduced him to other people, so he got other work, and. Uh, and then, so following that, I had another website which was nice and looked, looked professional. And uh, other than that, you know, I've done it all, all myself. I've got went to many, many uh, seminars and things like that, learning about these things. And I would highly recommend that. Uh, uh, there's lots of free ones around. You don't have to spend a fortune for it. Uh, whether they're online, reading books, things, things like that, or there was through your lo local uh, council and things like that. There was quite a few which were uh, which were going around at the time, helping people to set, set up businesses. So I, I learned a lot through that. And each kind of you go to a seminar, it might last an hour or two, and you may only learn one thing. 
uh, I mean, only one small thing, but when you've been to 10 or 20 seminars, you've learned 10 or 20 things, and that becomes a lot more important that you can, when you put those in, in, into practice, because all those small gains make a big gain at the end. Are there any books or seminars that stand out in your mind as being really pivotal in those early days? Uh, I think uh, what, one of the key things which I went to was learning about social media, and that was something I, I got. I, I was reluctant to at first. I didn't see the point in it. Uh, I, I was on Facebook just from a personal point of view, um, but you know I, I didn't see the point in Twitter or, or blogs. You know, it, was, it was something I thought, well, what, what, what is the point of that? And I went, I went to went to a seminar and learnt about it. And again, wasn't really kind of seeing the point in it. And then I was talking to a, a, a friend of mine, and he he was really in, in, into Twitter and and kind of explained it to me in a slightly different way. I said, all right, well, I've got nothing to lose. It's free to use. I'll I'll start with it and learning Twitter and in using it and using it in a way that works for me. Uh, rather than necessarily the way that the seminars were teaching me how to do it because in the room there was like 20 people with 20 different businesses so how it worked for one business or one person was going to be different for each so it's kind of learning that how it, to tailor that information for, for your own use rather than just a, a blanket well everybody else is doing it I'll do it the same but learning Twitter and using Twitter has given me links to other other people, which has led, led to projects and given me an online presence, which has led to a, a, a real world presence because you know you meet people through it. Excellent. Do you remember what your how your friend described Twitter that that intrigued you and and got you interested in it? Uh, yeah, it's basically it was. I'm not sure if it, it, he coined it this way or it was kind of I I interpreted it this way. It was basically it, it's networking, but you're sat at your computer. So instead of going into a room full of 50 people and going around the room introducing yourself and saying what, what you do, you're doing that in your own time at, at the computer. So you introduce yourself to people, talk, talk about what you do, ask them what they do, give them some information, and, and it's about building relationships rather than selling. And, and I think the, the same in, in real life uh, networking events. Uh, you shouldn't go up and just say, I'm James, I do architecture, Here's my card, and walk on to the next person. It's kind of about build, build, building that, that that relationship, understanding the person, and they may not need an architect. Then they may never need an architect, but they have friends and families. And if you've come across as a, a, you know, good, good impression, they're likely to to recommend you. And it's that kind of thing that that, that has worked for me through Twitter in uh, you know generating relationships with people, and then I've been recommended to other people who they know either in, in in actual life or as a, as a Twitter contact. It sounds like you had a, a fairly lean startup, meaning that you minimized your costs. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about how much how much money someone would need to go through the same process you did. How much money did you have saved up and how much of that was used to kind of get an idea of the financial picture to make this happen? I, the only investment I made was getting, the, getting a, a decent computer. Uh, and set, setting that up, I, I had the various kind of programs, AutoCAD and things, things like that. I, I already had them. If you don't have them, you're obviously go, go, going to need them because there are a few key ones which, which, which well, personally I use. Uh, so which ones are those? Uh, AutoCAD, Photoshop uh, are the main ones. Obviously, uh, I use Outlook for my emails uh, and Windows and things, things like that. But then there's a few programs like uh, SketchUp which you can get for free and things like that. But the, the, the key one that, that I use is AutoCAD, which luckily I, I, I had a copy of it. Uh, otherwise, it is quite expensive to, 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 to buy uh, straight out. But other than buying myself a computer, I've invested no money, of my, none of my personal money in, into the company at all. Everything that I've earned, I've certainly in the early days, I put back into it. And uh, I was kind of lucky, lucky to be, have a bit of help through my, my parents and things like that. But as soon as, uh, you know, I, I lived on a shoestring, I ran the business on, on, on a shoestring. If I could do it myself, I would do it. If I didn't know how to do it, I would ask somebody and uh, hopefully they would tell me how to do it and say, actually, it's not that hard. If you just learn it, it's quite easy. And or if it was beyond me, I would kind of then ask that their advice. But it's just you, you don't need a big financial in, input. 
Okay. Okay. Are there any things that looking back that you would have changed knowing what you know now? Is there anything you do differently? Um, in those early days. I think I was possibly in the early days I was more in the mindset that I was I was going to do these small residential projects, but as soon as I could I would go back to do, do commercial projects. And um I think the longer I've done these uh, residential or the smaller commercial projects, the longer I realize that is the best, better future that I want to go down. I, d I don't want to go down to building these huge, uh, these huge, huge, huge buildings. It, it's, and uh, I, I, in those early days, I always thought, well, at some point, those big projects will, will come back and I'll, I'll get back on them. And I was kind of gearing myself up and basically doing too much or doing slightly things in a slightly different direction where uh, if I'd focused purely on the residential straight away and the, and the private clients, I, w I possibly would have got to where I am now just a bit quicker. Well, James, I think that's a good place to end the show. Thank you for joining us today on the Business of Architecture. Thank you. And that's a wrap for another show about the Business of Architecture. To get more resources about how you as an architect can raise your fees, land the projects you love to work on, and get the time in your day back, join the members-only Business of Architecture Insider list for free by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash free. Enter your best email address there, and I will send you instant access to free resources, including my book, Social Media for Architects. If you'd like to discuss a thought or insight from today's show, visit businessofarchitecture.com slash podcast. On that page, you'll also find my notes from today's show and the action items I took away from our conversation. Until next week, keep rocking and go conquer the world. expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help architects conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5. Do it anyway.